All right, so uh, is my screen visible? Yeah. Cool. So uh, welcome everyone. This will be post contest discussion for uh, starters 128 for Code Chef, and we'll be discussing four problems for division two. All right. So uh, let us begin. We have problem one: maximize the array. All right. So uh, you were given an array of length n, and you can do the following operations any number of times. And they have said that the operation, you take an index i, you either increase it by one or you either decrease it by one. All right. Uh, so now it is clearly written. All right, uh, so sorry, I got disconnected. Uh, I'll begin again, all right? All right, so let's go. We have problem one, maximize the array. So it's given that you take up an array A of length N and you can do the following operation any number of times, all right? So you say you select an index I, you either increase AI by one or you decrease AI by one, all right? So now you have to find the minimum number of operations required to make the mix of the array maximum possible. So this is the key to this, right? Your target is to make mix of the array maximum possible. And we'll try to build our intuition towards this part, right? So let's say they have given you a very small definition of mix for all, all those who might not be familiar. They have said that, let's say, mix is defined to be the smallest non-negative integer that does not belong to the array. Right. So uh, for instance, they have given that the max of two, two, one is zero. Why? Because in this, you see that zero is the least smallest non-negative integer that is not coming this, right? Zero is non-negative and zero is definitely not visible in this. So I say zero is the max of this array. Similarly, max of three, one, zero, one is two and max of zero, three, one, two is four. All right. So they have given you a key also over here. Now the point over here is, we have a constraints n in 10 to the power 5 order that gives us an expected time complexity that I am trying to form a solution in O of n or maybe in n log n. I'm not going to get a solution in n square, meaning I, I can, I'm not going to brute out stuff. I need some better intuition that, than this. And let me see if I can form that. So the key is I have to minimize the number of operations. But remember, while you are minimizing, you also want to make the mix of the array maximum possible. All right. So let us actually try to see this uh, sample cases. You get a lot of hint from sample cases in all these uh, competitive uh, platforms and the questions, right? So if I look at the sample case, they have clearly mentioned that they will convert the array A to look like 0, 1, 2, 3. 
And when they do this, you will get the max as four. Why? Because zero was present, one was present, two was present, three was present, but four is not there. So I know I have made max as four. And do you think I can go above four? No. Why? Because I have total four elements in the array. If I have made one element zero, one element one, one element two, one element three, then the max is four. Now let's say I wanted to make the max as five. If I want to make the max as five, I could have made some number as four. Because if max is not four, four is present. But when I do that, I'll be skipping over some other number. So I know that five max is not possible. Four I can go and four I have made definitely. And the number of operations it took was two. Now, when I look at the other cases also, they have written, all right, zero, one, two. If let's say you take this array as two, zero, one, whatever it's written, you say the max, if you just tell me what is the max of this array, you see that yes, max of this array is three. Why? Zero is there, one is there, two is there. Max is definitely three. And they have argued that that is the maximum max you can go because they have given the output as zero. That means you are not required to do any more operations and this is the maximum max you can form. So in when I was solving the problem or when you might be solving the problem, sample cases are pretty good thing to first look at and try to build your intuition. All right. And this, this is what is happening over here. Case number two is giving me a very good intuition that if the array looked like 201 or indirectly gave me a max of three, they argued that that was the highest max possible. That is why output according to them was zero. Is that right? Now let's say for the last array, you say 0144410 was present. What is the highest max you can form? You can definitely form the highest max as four again, which is actually the size of the array. So you say, all right, I'll try to imagine if I can make the max as four to just confirm my theory. And if I do that, what is the least number of operations I would require? I say, all right, they have given you a very good analogy over it. They said, make this two, make this three, keep this as, keep this as one only and keep this as zero. So you will require three operations and you will get the max as four. So by reading the sample cases, reading the question, my small intuition has been built. What is that intuition? What is that intuition? My intuition is built in this direction that now I know somewhere that if I ask you, what is the max max of a N size array? You know, that is equal to N. Is that right? This intuition is clear. This is my idea one or my intuition one. This is intuition one. This idea is clear. I can see that even by the cases, I understand this. And even normally I get this picture that if I keep the array as a array that looks like or has the numbers starting from zero to N minus one, then I know it will have a max equal to N. And arguably from the sample cases also, and by simply observing and making, I, I, if I can make more cases, I realize that that is the highest max I can go. So I think this idea is not clear, right? This idea is clear. I have to make the maximum max of the array as N, or I will try to achieve if I can make the maximum max of an array as N. So remember in the condition, it is given that target is to maximize the max. Whatever minimum number of operations you require to do that, that is the secondary condition now. Because now you know, even if you are able to make a max that is equal to, let's say, n minus 1 in operation count, let's say, op1, even if you make the max as n in, let's say, operation count op2, and you make max n minus 1 as in op1, you know n is greater than n minus 1. So if even if op1, even if I say operation 1, count required to make a max of n minus one would be smaller than OP two. Will you make the max as n minus one? If you know, you can make the max as n, will you bother in wondering, should I make a mix lower than n or not? No, I know that by the question, I will not get confused. Now I have the intuition clear. I will try to make the max as n. All right. So this is the whole idea behind the problem. Now the problem boils down to you have to make the max as n. So I'll add up a page. All right. You have to make the max as n. And you have to try that when you make that max as n, what is the minimum number of operations you will require? 
So now, now the new problem looks like I have some numbers, A1, A2, A3, so on till An. And I need their max. I need their max to be equal to N. That means all these numbers should transform into an array which looks like having 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, so on, one number n minus 1 coming single, single time. And this will make the max equal to n. So is this clear? I hope this idea has become clear. Now I have no, I know I need to make max as n. That for that, I need to convert the existing array into an array that looks like having numbers 0 to n minus 1 coming single, single time. So what should my ideal case be? Now, the next is minimize operations in this. Minimum number of operations you need to find to do this actually. What do you think should be your approach now? Now, let's say you imagine that there is a number in this. Let's say I talk about this number A3. If I want to make A3, and I, I argue that currently nobody, nobody in the array looks like zero. Now, you know, you want a zero. That is definite. You do want a zero, right? If you want a zero, tell me sh what should be my ideal AI to select? What should, forget about A3. Let's say I frame this like this. If I want a zero, if I want a zero in my array, and I have some numbers A1, A2, A3, so on till AN. What should be the ideal number I should take, which will give me the least operations that is decreasing or increasing by one to make that number zero or create a new zero. What do you think that is going to be there? Correct. The closest one that is to zero. Make sense? That means out of all these numbers, whatever is the minimum number, don't you think whatever is the minimum number in this, that is going to be the closest to zero. Arguably, whatever is the lowest number is in this, that should actually become or try to become zero. And by the same logic, I can now say whatever is going to be the next minimum in this array should try to become one. Whatever is the next, next minimum in the array should try to become two and so on and so on. That means it gives me a new idea that if I want to convert or find the minimum number of operations to make this array look like an array 0, 1, 2, 3, so on till n minus 1, or typically saying an array having all the numbers from 0 to n minus 1 coming once, what should I do? I should actually take the sorted array of A and then I can brutally simply calculate what cost would have it take me to convert a1 to 0? What cost would it take me to convert a2 to a2 to 1? What cost will it take me to convert a3 to 2? And so on, a n to n minus 1. After I have sorted this out. Arguably, when I do this, I know for a fact that once this is done, the operation count I will calculate is going to be the minimum possible. Is that right? We'll try to, we'll try to analyze this on, uh, the test cases. All right. So I think that will become much more clear. So what was the test case given to us? Let's I'll talk about the third case. You had the case as four, four, one, and zero. So, you know, I will sort this first. This becomes zero. This becomes, uh, zero, one, four, and four. Now, ideally I want it to look like zero, one, two, and three. How do I do that? Definitely. I have sorted the array. I can traverse on this array. I know what this number should actually look like. So this number is zero. It should look like a zero. So do you need, you think I need any operation counts? No. So what is the operation count? It gives me zero. Now this number is one. It needs to look like a one. Need any operation counts? No. Again, let's take a zero. Now this number is a four. I need to look at like two. That means I'll have to decrease this by two. That means operation count it gives me is two. And similarly, this number is four. It needs to look like three. This gives me an operation count as one. All right. This gives me an operation count as one. And now add everything up. Don't you get three? Which checks out. Is that right? 
in three operations, you can convert your array to look like an array having zero to n minus one, or in this case, three numbers coming once. And that gives you the max as highest max that is four. So done and dusted. All right. So this is the whole idea behind the problem. Are there any doubts? I hope this is clear. If not, we can actually look into the code part two quickly, get uh, going. All right. All right. So we are clear. Let us look at the code now. All right. So yeah, this is going to be the code. So very basic stuff. You take the input for test cases. Now you take the input for the array. So up till here, I'm just taking basic inputs. Now I say, after I've taken the input of the array, I'll call the simple sort STL function, and I'm going to sort this array out. Correct. Now I am going to sort this array out and I'll say after this, I will create an OP count variable that is starts from zero. I am going to traverse every number for the array. And now what do you think is going to be the operation count? Firstly, what number are you trying to make AI to? If let's say this is the AI number and you have a zero based indexing. So this is zero, one, two, three. Don't you think this matches? So what are you actually ideally trying to do? You're trying to convert every AI number to I. And how do you do that? How do you do that? You know, you are either given to decrease by one or increase by one. That means whatever is the absolute difference in these two values, that gives me the operation count. All right. That means what can I do? Start with OP count zero. Now add on OP count. I say OP count gets increased by absolute difference between AI and I. This will help me make AI in the least possible count equal to I. All right. And when I print OP count outside, this gives me the right answer. All right. So basic code, right? Now, what is going to be the time complexity for this? Naturally, you are using an STL function. This STL function is a very basic function that runs in backend in n login complexity, where n is the size of the array. Am I using anything beyond that, which is superseding this complexity? No, I have a for loop over here that runs in n complexity and I have an n log n complexity over here for sorting. So I can say overall complexity is n log n plus n, you can say, but what is the superseding term out of these two? n log n. So you can say overall complexity is n log n, correct? And what about space? Are you using anything extra besides the space to store the input? No. We are only using simple variables. That means I need that I can report the space to be constant. All right. So, all right. So now, what can what is going to be the uh, n log in complexity defined if I know that n is an order of ten to the power five, or rather two into ten to the power five? I know I will have a complexity that looks in order of. I think for 10 to the power five complexity log in term gives you approximately 18 to 20 iterations. Is that right? So if that is the case, now you will get a order of, uh, I can say this as two into 10 to the power five. That is the N into log in that gives you approximately 20 iterations. So overall, I can say this is in 10 to the power six order. Correct. And you know, this is definitely going to pass, not going to give you a TLE at all. All right. All right. So again, as I said, space complexity is uh, not ON if I don't consider the space for storing the input. Correct. If I do st consider start considering that, then I can say space is definitely O of N. Besides that, what extra space have you used to actually calculate your answer? If you try to report that in terms of that, ideally you can say that space is constant for that purpose, but definitely you can report your space to be O of N also, but O of N is definitely there because you need to take the input, right? If you don't take the input for the array, how are things going to work? All right. All right. So, uh, fine. You can actually, uh, if, if that is the case for, uh, I think I did submit this out code and that was working, but if that is the case coming out to be, then you can definitely take long, long over here. If, uh, that is the answer that is falling for you guys. All right. Although I think, uh, yeah, you can actually take login. That would be a reason why your maybe code is failing. All right. Works. Not a big deal. Idea should be clear, right? 
So are we guys clear on the idea? All right, so I think we are good to go. We can move on to the next problem. All right. So this is an interesting problem, right? We have disjoint non-increasing array name. Uh, what does it read? You are given an array A of length N and you can do the following operation at most once. All right. So you select an non-empty subsequence, uh, subsequence, sorry, such that no two consecutive elements are chosen. This is part one. And then what do I, all right. Uh, I think we have some doubt in this. All right, so that, that might, the, might, might be the case, right? You can take long for this. Uh, so if you have guys have any doubt, you can actually open up the mic and share that out so that other people can also say, please refrain from chatting uh, in the section itself, all right? Right, so we, we'll move on to problem two. So uh, as I said, you are going to do the following operation at most once. That means either you don't do it at all, or you do it at most once, one time. What is that operation? You say that you select any non-empty subsequence such that no two consecutive elements are chosen. And then you add any positive integer X to all the chosen elements, right? So what does this essentially mean? What does this essentially mean? You are given an array. You say, all right, the array is A1, A2, A3, a4, A5, so on till n. And you select up some numbers in this. All right. So you say, maybe I'll select this number. Maybe I'll select this number. Maybe I'll select this number. But I have to make sure that while I do, I don't select adjacent numbers. So if I have selected A2, I cannot select A1 and A3. I can, if I've selected A4, I cannot select A3 and A5. And so on, so on. So the target is don't select adjacent or two consecutive elements, correct? Whatever subsequence you select in that you don't have consecutive elements. Once this is, once this is clear, what do we now do? We say, all right, I am going to increase. Let's say I chose a2, a, a4 and an. I'm going to increase their value to a2 plus x. Some number a, a, a4 plus x, and this is going to be an plus x. And this X is chosen by me. So this X can be any positive integer. All right. So I think the question is not clear. Now, what do we have to achieve? Finally, we have to achieve that you are going to make the array non-decreasing in order. All right. So what do you mean by non-decreasing? All right. This is a very different term, right? One thing is increasing. One thing is non-decreasing. Both can be a bit confusing. Non-decreasing over here means that the equality symbol also follows up. So if, if I say non-decreasing, that means every AI is less than equal to AI plus one for all I from zero to N minus two. All right. So this is the case. This is called non-decreasing. Basically meaning that you can have the array which can have equal elements, but equal, this equality symbol to be followed. But what are they actually trying to follow the pattern as? You have an increasing sort of a pattern, although it also involves equality. So the array that has one, one, two, two, maybe something like this, this is also non-decreasing. An array like maybe one, three, four, five, this is definitely non-decreasing. So both are definitely the case. All right, so I hope this is clear now. So we, our target is we have to make this array non-decreasing in order. Now, let us try to look at the constraints for this. We say that, all right, n is given in 10 to power 5 order. This gives me an expected time complexity as O of n, right? Or maybe n log n. I cannot go above in a complexity of n square, something like that. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Sir, what does that mean? That sum of n over all test cases won't exceed 2 into 10 power. All right. So what happens in the behind is let's say you actually run this, uh, code piece of code. I'm audible. Uh, who asked this up? I can actually yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So 
what happens i'll give you a very quick uh, brief on this you will get a much better brief about i'll actually link up a small piece of article for this generally i'll not go into the detail of this what happens when you actually run up a code piece of code you say that that runs in a complexity of t into n all right because you have some test cases is that right and every test case you are running every test case and each and every test case has some arrays has some different arrays given to you with a size of n so now you need a complexity that says that when you run the file containing all the cases then you don't owe, exceed the time limit that is why we keep the limit of n over all cases or we say that sum of n in one test case file which runs whatever arrays will be given to me the total length of these arrays won't exceed 10 to the power 5 order all right so when we would have made a solution let's say we make a solution in o of n complexity all right let's say we make a solution in o of n complexity so you can now argue that what is going to happen let's say let's say i'll i'll take a very small case in this let's say you had five cases with you all right basically you can assume t as 1 if they saved yeah that is also so let's say let's say even let's say t was 5 so you had five cases correct now let's say the argument is in this five cases you are not going to exceed the limit of each and every n summing over as 2 into 10 to the power 5 so i will say that if i have created a solution in o of n complexity then i know that that solution is going to run why is it that going to run because i will be actually running the test case file which is going to run five iterations first and inside every iteration i will be running an o of n solution so now i know that let's say uh i had five n's correct n1 n2 n3 n4 n5 and the sum of them is not exceeding 2 into 10 to the power 5 limit then don't you think i am well good to go and not going to get it really am i making sense in this hello am i not audible uh you are audible yeah i'm audible so am i making sense in this this is a sir, standard standard sir will log and uh, and log and work yeah and login will also work sir but we are uh, assuming t as 1 so how can we assume t as 1 no that i i was not talking about assuming t as 1 right don't try to read the chats per se all right let, like assuming t as 1 is basically just trying to uh, make up a case where you say the properties are getting fulfilled just to visualize this better assuming t as 1 means let's say you take t as one let's say there was only one case in this then because they are arguing that n is not going to exceed 2 into 10 to the power 5 they indirectly try to tell you that if t is one n is in 2 n is equal to 2 2 into 10 to the power 5 maximum now if now tell me if i give you an array of 2 into 10 to the power 5 order don't you think an n log n solution will work in that because you only have one case so you run the file test case loop runs one time inside that you get the array input that has the size n and that n size is not exceeding 2 into 10 to the power 5 so now n log n works right yes correct similarly o of n works will n square work no n square will not work right because if you have 2 into 10 to the power 5 order that means n square is not going to work so Sir, this but is what yeah. if t is not 1 and t is greater than 1 yeah so if t is greater than 1 then n's are set in such a way right that is the argument i told you take t as 1 so that you are able to imagine that if t was 1 there is only single n that is keeping a limit not exceeding 2 into 10 to the power 5 but even if t is greater than 1 the cases are set like this that every array's total size or sum of all the array sizes is still not exceeding so the test case is indirectly made such a way that t into n this order doesn't exceed 2 into 10 to the power 5 still n log n will work yeah n log n will work because 
if the you know in one second you are actually given the uh, i should say power to actually have 10 to the power 8 iterations almost now even if you add that log in term inside this even if you add that log in term what what would that essentially mean that if you have a uh, log in part exceeded in this you will have maximum some 20 iterations per test per test cases per uh, array getting added so if i'm talking about one test case file let's say it has some five, six, seven arrays, 10 arrays, let's say, every array will have maximum 20 iterations more. So overall net sum is going to not get exceeded when I say iterations are not going to exceed 10 to power eight. Okay, sir, got it. All right, because now the complexity is going to look somewhere, uh, now the complexity is going to look some, something like this. For every case, you are running an analog in complexity. Correct? I think this is clear. Again, we are diverting a lot from the topic itself. So I would recommend you, if you want to go deeper inside this, you can actually look up some videos for this. I can also tag out some videos. I think the chart is definitely there to help you in this. Correct? So let us not deviate. We'll try to bring up the topic back to the PCD discussion. All right. Cool. So, uh, what will we be discussing? Let's say, let's say now I, uh, so now we have the case one, one, three, one. All right. We have the case four, one, three, two. Now it is given. Yes. It is given no over here. Why do you think that you will read the explanation? We had very simple, just as I argued previously, sample cases are something that helps you a lot in the beginner phases. So when you see the array one, one, three, one, you say that, all right, what can I essentially do up till here? The array is non-decreasing one, one, three up till here. The array is non-decreasing. After this, the array is starting to decrease. Correct. You have one, which is lower than three. Do you want that? No. So can't you take this one, add upon some value to this, preferably some value that is going to make it to be uh, turn out to be greater than three and you will be good to go. Let's say I add four to this. Now the array becomes one, one, three, four. And the answer turns out as yes. Is that right? Now, what about this? What about this? Why do you think the answer to this is no? You wanted this array to become non-decreasing in order. Now you started from the first element. You said, all right, I have a four. Now I have a one. If I have a one, essentially, what do I want to do? I want to make this one reach a value that is greater than equal to four. Because this one is smaller than four currently. I need to make this number go greater than equal to four. So I know I should take, let's say I take a value of three. I add upon this and I have made this number four. Now. now, once you have done this, remember you have fixed that in this subsequence, you are taking the subsequence. You have uh, the operation, which you're trying to do. You have begin with this operation and you have taken the number in that operation as this index or this number one and the X value you have selected is three now. Now, after this, you say when this number becomes, let's say now the array was four, one, three, and two. Now you made this number to reach four. So you added X equal X equals to three in this. You said, all right, X equals to three. Good to go. I may make this array four, four, three, and two. Now this number, next number, that is three. This is lower than four. That means you need to increase this, but because you were forced to make the number over here, increase its value to four. Can you add on any value to this number now? No. What violation will that, why am I saying no? What, what are you trying to violate then? You will violate the condition itself that because these two elements are adjacent, you cannot work on three. Now you will have to skip over three and you will now start whatever you want to do after three. Is that right? I cannot do that. 
I cannot hamper three now. Three is fixed now. And because of this, I know that now, let's say I've gone to two. Even if I make this number two, let's say I know that now three is greater than two. So let me increase this value. And because now X is X, I took X as three. Let me make this value as uh, two plus three, that is five. So now array looks like four, four, three, and five from the initial array. Essentially, what did I do? I took X as three and I took I took uh, the subsequence as taking I equals to one and three. If this is, uh, if I mark this as zero uh, index as zero, one, two, and three, then I know essentially I've taken the first index, the third index, and I have increased its value by three. Did I receive a non-decreasing array? No. And I was not able to receive this non-decreasing array because of this number. I was not able to hamper this number. And why was I not able to hamper this number? Because I had hampered the previous number. So this is the whole crux of the question. You are trying not to, you cannot hamper adjacent numbers. So once you think you have satisfied your condition at some ith index, you have to necessarily skip over the i plus one th index. If arguably you have to, uh, you have taken the operation as taking some value and increasing the ith index value by some x value, you have to skip. So now what is going to be our approach towards this? All right. So let us try to discuss the approach. So now let's say the array is a1, a2, a3, a4, so on till n. You begin from the left hand side. Up till you are able to find numbers in non-decreasing pattern, do you think you need to do anything now? If let's say a1 is less than equal to a2 is less than equal to a3, up till here the condition is satisfied. Do you think I need to do anything with a1, a2, and a3? No. Why? Because I know they are following the pattern. Let's say now what happens, this becomes a breakpoint. This becomes a breakpoint. And this is where a3 begins to look greater than a4. Then you know things are going to be a problem. So that means I now have to stop. And this is where I need to start analyzing. So we'll try to draw up some base cases and we'll try to see what is happening. All right. So what is the first base case? Very simple base case to understand. Let's say the array is non-decreasing. Initially, the initial array is non-decreasing. Initial array, non-decreasing, non-decreasing in nature. You print, yes. Correct. I'll add one more case to this. Let's say the initial array was not non-decreasing, but it was non-decreasing till n minus two index and this n minus one index was lower. Then you can also select this last number and you can make this to go a value greater selecting this last number as the part of subsequence and again report your answer as yes. So these two cases are definitely these, I have drawn up two cases. You can say two cases. These two cases are definitely going to give me yes every time. So base case are done, done and dusted. If the array is already non-decreasing in order, then I will print a yes. And if I know the array is, let's say five, six, seven, eight, and then this last number is one. So up till here, the pattern was true. Last number got breaked. So not, not a big deal. Take this last number, increase this to some value that makes it to be greater than equal to the second last number. And you are good to go again. So again, yes. So I have drawn up two cases. I hope this is clear. These are going to be my base cases. All right. Base cases. Initial array not decreasing, print to yes. Up till n minus two, also not decreasing and only last number being a problem. Again, print yes, because ideally you will take that last number and increase it. All right. Now, what is in the next case? Now, what happens if the pattern is getting followed up till some ith index and after that it breaks? So I'll call this as breakpoint. I'll call this index as breakpoint. All right. What will I say now? I will say that when I have this breakpoint, the number at this breakpoint is a of i. The number next to it is a of i plus one. And I'll also take the number again next to this. This is a of i plus two. Now I'll, I'll keep up these numbers. Let's say a i was four. A i plus one was three. And let's say a i plus two. Let's say this a i plus two number was six. Now try to imagine this way. You know that you can now take this AI plus one number as part of a subsequence. This is where you can start taking this as part of a subsequence. Now, ideally you have to make this, you have to increase this. 
and you can increase this by x. Tell me, what do you think is the buffer or range, range of this AI number you can actually select? I am going to argue that you can make AI plus one, either you can make this AI plus one either equal to four, five or six. Is that right? Correct. Four to six. You cannot exceed six. If you do, you again, you break your pattern and you definitely have to exceed greater than equal to four limit because that is where it was failing. So you have created a buffer now. You know that if the first breakpoint where I'm actually talking about, if I receive a value AI greater than AI plus one, then I will try to first see what is the lower limit. What is the lower limit of increasing it? And what is the upper limit of increasing it? How do I calculate these? How, what do I define these terms to be? I say lower limit is going to be AI minus AI plus one. I know the lowest X I can take is if I talk about this case, lowest X I can take is one. I cannot take lower than X. I need minimum lower limit of X as one. Because if I don't, if I take something lower than one, I will not be able to satisfy this condition. And if, what is the upper limit you can create? Upper limit is three, right? Because if you exceed three, you will definitely violate the condition among AI plus one and AI plus two. And you know very well that if you hamper AI plus one, you cannot now hamper AI plus two. So now you know you have a lower limit and upper limit for this case now. Is it trying to make sense? Is, is the approach trying to make sense? Now I have a lower limit defined to be one. I have an upper limit defined to be the limit three. Now, don't you think this is going to happen for all the numbers? Don't you think? All right, lower, lower point. Lower limit is the minimum X you need to take to actually satisfy the condition of making these two values look like less than equal to that is if AI plus one is three and AI is four, I need this three value to become either four, five or six lowest. I need to make this is four. That means lowest X I need to add in this three is one. That is the lower limit of X and the highest X I can add on this three is that would be the previous element, right? That would be the pre difference, not the previous element, the difference of the previous element minus the current element. And what is going to be the upper limit? Upper limit is going to be the difference between the next element, AI plus two, if it exists, if it exists, uh, exists and minus AI plus one. So now I know upper limit is three. Why am I defining this like, like this? Because now I can argue that this is going to happen in all the array. This condition like this is going to definitely happen in all the array. Array is going to look somewhere, some in haphazard manner where there be some, there will be some breakpoints and so on, so on. And I know every breakpoint will have a lower limit and an upper limit. Is that right? So first I know I will define, start defining. I can start my checking of adding to the subsequence from this correct next upper limit is going to depend on the next greater. Uh, next element, next element, not next greater element, next element. Let's say this number was actually, uh, this limit I am defining is coming out as positive in this case. Let's, let's try to follow up. Let's try to keep up and we'll understand what I will trying to do. All right. So I am arguing that you have AI plus one. This is the first breakpoint you received. You said, I'm going to add this, make this part of my subsequence, add this to my subsequence. And now. Once I do this, I, cal I will calculate the lower limit of this and the upper limit of this. And once I do this, I am going to shift my focus and jump two elements. So I know if I, uh, sorry, one element, if I know that I am standing at a of I, I am going to jump two indices or two elements rather actually, if I'm standing at a of I, or if you take the POE of a of I plus one, you are not, cannot hamper a of I plus two now, because now a of I plus one has been hampered and you jump to I plus three. 
and you keep on doing this process you keep on doing this process for every time so you you uh, essentially bring up a pseudo code and you say let me do this condition of checking if ai is greater than ai plus 1 then i will get some lower limit i am going to get some upper limit what is the lower limit lower limit is going to be ai minus ai plus 1 and what is going to be the upper limit upper limit going to is going to be if possible if i plus 2 element is possible then i'll say ai plus 2 minus ai plus 1 and now the argument is if ai is greater than i plus 1 then i know i need to jump two indices if i'm standing at a of i so i'll jump two indices because i know now i have hampered a of i plus 1 i cannot hamper a of i plus 2 so i'll jump to i plus 3 and else if this condition is not satisfied i now say if this condition is not getting satisfied that means i'm good to go right i'm following the pattern if i'm following the pattern i do just simply i plus plus is things becoming clear up till it why now i'll argue why am i defining lower limit and upper limit all right what is going to happen is you now say you have defined a lower limit you have defined an upper limit but what are you essentially trying to do i'll take up a case and make you understand this let's say the array was 5 3 5 3 6 and 3 now you would have said this is the first breakpoint i know 5 is greater than 3 so i need to make this 3 go up some value i can either make this value as 5 or i can make this value as 6 what should i make this value as if i make this value as 5 then i'll be essentially fixing my x to be 2 if i do that array becomes 5 5 6 and 3 and i am now standing at this index current index and over here i know i needed to in increase this because 6 is again greater than 3 i need to increase this i'm i'm standing sorry uh, not at this index 6 index correct right? i'm standing at i'm standing at here so i was here i have jumped to two indices i'm standing at here So when I check the condition again, I said, "All right, six is greater than three. I need to increase this, but x got fixed at two. So even if you increase this, this becomes five. And do you think five, five, six, five is non-decreasing? No. So I should have not taken five. I should have taken six instead. If I try to take six, I know I'll be making the index array look like five, six, six, and six. So what did I actually do? What did I actually do? Correct. That is what we are going to do. Sir means x will be fixed throughout. Correct. At big, you you read the question right. That is given the question. The operation you are doing is telling you you will add x to all the chosen elements. So first we need a buffer of x. What are the possible values of x I can take, and how do I get that buffer? Initial starting buffer. I get that initial starting buffer from the first breakpoint, where I saw that the array was not following my condition. and when i got this initial buffer i will now what i'm going to argue i'm going to argue that out of all those buffers i need to find a condition or i need to make a buffer come up which actually gives me x some possible values of x meaning meaning you where let's say you the array was you were, you had that array ai a1 a2 a3 a4 A five, A six, and so on. Now let's say this was a breakpoint. A two become greater than A three, and so you calculated the lower limit from here and the upper limit from here. Next time, let's say you jumped, you jumped, you jumped to A four, and now A four also turned out to be greater than A five. So now you will again calculate the lower limit from here and the upper limit from here. But what do you think is going to be the buffer now? You have two possible buffers now. what do you think you should take x you need to take the maximum of these two buffer two lower limits that is i am going to take maximum of ll1 and ll2 ll2 i if i make this out as 2 this is 2 correct upper limit 2 upper limit 1 and i am going to take the minimum of upper limit 1 and the upper limit 
Where am I going to do this? Why do you think I'm going to do this? Because if let's say over here, the condition was a two was a two was you said a two was turning out to be greater than a three. Then, you know, a three has to become definitely something that some value greater than equal to a two. So the buffer you calculated in lower limit was one. Now let's say a five, a four, a five was also not fulfilling the condition. So you need to increase a five to a four also, right? When you do that, you need some value to get added to a five. What do you think you should take these two values to be? If let's say the value I need to make a five to a four is let's say X two and the value I need to make a three to a two is actually X one. Shouldn't I take the maximum of these two? If I take X one, if let's say X one is less than X two, do you think after fixing as X one as X, if a three condition will become fulfilled because a three will now get an added value of X one and it will become greater than equal to a two. But do you think a five and a four condition is still going to get fulfilled? No, it is not going to get fulfilled. Correct. Because X two was greater than X one. But you made X2 only get increased. You made X2 only get increased by X, which was X1 actually, which is low. That means A5 still did not fulfill the condition. So out of all the lower limits, wherever the condition is not fulfilling, I need the maximum lower limit. If I don't take the maximum lower limit, I am not going to fulfill the condition. This is part one. By same logic, I argue, if I have, if I want to, I want to increase a three to definitely go greater than equal to a two, but do I want a three to go above a four also? No, I want it still to remain less than equal to a four. So the upper limit for a three is UL one, which is a four minus a three. Now, if you think what, if let's say the upper limit from this is UL one and upper limit from this, that is making a five go up some value, which value still makes a five less than equal to a six. If that upper limit is you will do, do you think you should take the bigger out of these two or the lower out of these two? You should definitely take the lower out of these two. If you take the bigger out of these two, then you know, if let's say you will two is bigger. So not going to be a problem. You will increase a five and it is still going to get less than equal to a six value, but aren't you going to violate the condition over here? Because the limit of a three to b less than equal to a four was u l one and u l one was lower. You went ahead with u l two and you said no. Now I know a three is going to increase and it is going to go above a four and I don't want that because that is going to again make my condition fall false. Adjacent, I am not going to get a non decreasing array now. Are you able to understand this? Yes. All right. So this is going to be the crux idea of the problem. What, where do we start with? We say first from left hand side, find the first break point. At that break point, stop. And this is where I start analyzing. I start analyzing and saying that, all right, my analysis forms on the factor. If wherever I find the condition to be not true, that is AI plus AI is not, uh, AI is greater than AI plus one. Then I calculate the lower limit. I calculate the upper limit and I definitely jump to elements. But when I do this, I don't do this actually directly. That is simple calculation. I actually say, I'm going to take lower limit as minimum, sorry, maximum. If I can write this out, you will take this as maximum of lower limit. If you take that as a variable comma AI minus AI plus one. And if there is an existence of I plus two element, then you say upper limit becomes minimum of upper limit comma AI plus two minus AI plus one. And now once you have done this, what do you think is going to be the answer? And the else part is clear, right? If, if I don't uh, get this condition, I do a simple I plus plus. Now, after everything, after the whole story, what am I actually calculating? You have now a very or uh, two terms with you, you have now two terms with you. Uh, those two terms are lower limit and lower limit. This is lower limit and you have the upper limit. That is the lowest X you can select and the highest X you can select. Now, if there is actually a possible buffer of selecting X lower limit, lower limit will be less than equal to upper limit. 
Is that right? If lower limit is less than equal to upper limit, then there will exist some possible value of X, which could have been chosen for the numbers, which you just defined while you were jumping accordingly, either one index or two index, so on for which when you would have added X to them, you will get your array in non-decreasing order. And if anywhere, when you did this lower limit turned out to be greater than upper limit, then do you think an answer exists? No. Answer, Sir, can you take that example that four sorry. elements you took? Yeah, yeah. I'll take this one. Example. Ah, this one. What was this example? Five, three, five, and six. Sorry, uh, this was five, three, six, and five. Six and three, sorry. Correct. So now, how will I start? I'll start from the left-hand side. I'll say, all right, starting at i equals to zero. Five is greater than three. So calculate the lower limit. Lower limit becomes two. And i plus two index is definitely there. So there is a possibility of upper limit. Upper limit is upper limit is six minus three. That is three. Good to go. Now you jump to indices and you come i equals to two. Correct. Now you say, all right, six is greater than three. Six is greater than three. What is the lower limit now? Lower limit gets updated three. to maximum of these two. This is three. And th is there an existence of I plus two element? No. Right. So upper limit still remains three. That is three. Now, isn't LL less than equal to UL? Yes. And that is actually three. There is only one element. That means if you selected X as three and you took the numbers in this general, uh, you can say demonstration where I had taken targeted this number and this number, if you would have added this common X to this, that is three, you would have gotten an array five, six, six, and six. And this is definitely not decreasing. Correct. Is there a not decreasing? So I hope the example has not become clear. Sir, take five, four, six, three. All right. I'll take five, four, six, three. Five, four, six, and three. So now you say, all right, five is greater than four. Standing at I equals to zero, five is greater than four. I say, all right, what is now the lower limit? One. What is the upper limit now? Upper limit is two. Is that right? So now you jump two indices and you go I equals to two. Now you say six minus three, because I know six is greater than three. So there is definitely a lower limit. Lower limit is this three should become equal to six or greater than equal to six, which means lower limit for this is three and upper limit, because there is no existence of any number outside this upper limit still remains two. Now lower limit is greater than upper limit. So I argue that the answer is no. Because if lower limit turned out to be greater than upper limit, that means I have no possible X selection. You cannot take any X, which will give you the correct answer. Can you take any X in this? No. Correct. How, if I actually go in the deep, de de uh, much deep into this, you can say, all right, I was, when I was talking about this number four, ideally it should have become either five or six. If this number becomes five means X is one. And if this number becomes six, this X is two. And this is not following the case for this, because now if three gets added either by one or by two, the number still three becomes either four or five, which is still less than six. So you are never able to create a non-decreasing array because the buffer of the X was not feasible at all. The lower limit of X actually got above than the upper limit of X. All right. I hope now the question has become clear. And we have to update that maximum of lower limit and minimum. of. Correct. We have to update that every time because I know that let's say I was standing over here. I calculate the lower limit of five and four pair. Now I need to calculate the limit for five, three and uh, six and three also, right? Lower limit. And Out this of condition, all... yeah. we have to check on that now. LLE we have to check on that. We have to check on that. Okay. So we'll actually look, look into the code part. And I think that the, then things will become much more clear in this. All right, so I think everyone is following up till here. If you have any doubt, you can unmute and ask. I can take up some more cases to either get the things going, or we can actually jump to the code part. Clear, clear. Clear? All right, I think uh, Sham was writing no. I think it's clear. 
All right, let's look at the code, then see if you have any more doubts for this. So big, simple things, taking the input, not going to be a big problem. Again, as I explained, breakpoint. So this is the first place where I think the arrow is not following the condition. So I say breakpoint is negative one initially. And I say, start from zero, go to less than n, le less than n minus one, actually, sorry. Go till n minus one. And now say that is AI greater than AI plus one. If that is, this becomes my first breakpoint and I break, breakpoint becomes I and I break out. Clear? Now I argue, is breakpoint equal to negative one? Or is breakpoint plus two greater than equal to n? If breakpoint is equal to negative one, that means the array was already non-decreasing. And if breakpoint plus two was greater than equal to n, that means you were standing. If the condition was not fulfilled, it was fulfilled. It was not fulfilled at a condition of n minus two index maximum. That means the array was not decreasing up till the n minus two place. And the last element was decreasing. So in both cases, you know, answer is yes, because this is the base case I discussed first. Correct. I had made, made these two base cases initially to you. Either the array is fully non-decreasing or the array is non-decreasing up till the second last element. And then the last element is decreasing. So you can say, I'll select this last element, make it some big value to go it above the second last element. And I'm still going to print my answer as yes. So these are the it two can, bases. It can also happen that last second element is uh, less and last element is correct in the sorted order. order. Yeah, that can happen. So, but that is not going to be definitely a yes case, right? We are trying to first bring up base cases where I always print yes. Sir, that will be also, uh, if you do five, six, seven, uh, five, six, seven, and instead of one, you print nine, eight and, and nine, right? Uh, instead of eight, you can put five. Uh, yeah. And instead of one nine, so this will also be true. Yes, this will also be true, but this is, this is what is going to get handled by our logic, right? I am only handling the cases where I know the, th that either the whole array was non decreasing or the last element was non decreasing or uh, sorry, the last element was smaller. This case specifically deals with the fact that up till here, the array was non decreasing. And then you had a pattern break, right? Okay. So that gets Under handled by our code that, that gets handled by our other piece of code. These are the base cases. Base cases I define only as saying that either the whole array is not decreasing. That is five, six, seven, eight, nine, or five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the last element is one or some element actually less than eight. All right. Implementation is not going to be a big part for this. You can definitely implement this out anyway. All right. So. I have created base cases like this while I was attempting the question. You can definitely create some more better choice of part code for this to handle the base case yourself. All right. In each, you understand what do I mean by base case in this, right? When I know definitely the answer is yes. Correct. All right. All yes. right. So I hope this is clear. So I have printed yes in this. Good to go. Now this is where we start the main code part. I define a lower limit. Lower limit is in base case is only include pattern, which will not be covered in the logic that we create afterwards. Correct. All right. So that is what essentially I have done. I hope that is clear. Now I define the lower limit. I say, all right, a, uh, the breakpoint that is where I had stored the I lower limit starts from a of breakpoint minus a of breakpoint plus one. Correct. I know breakpoint plus one index is definitely existing because I have run a loop till n minus one, less than n minus one. So I know breakpoint plus one exists. Now I say upper limit. Upper limit is defined initially as negative one. And then I check is breakpoint plus two index possible? If it is, then I update my upper limit to B equal to A of breakpoint plus two minus breakpoint plus one. Good to go. Now I say, I begin with long, long I equals to breakpoint. This is where I start checking the patterns. If I'm able to fulfill, I run a while loop. I say, is the pattern breaking? If it is, then I will make my lower limit 
to be max of lower limit comma a i a f i minus a f i plus one. And if i plus two index exists, then I will also update the upper limit to be minimum of upper limit comma a of i plus two minus a of i plus one. And then because I know I have hampered the index a of i plus one, I cannot hamper the index i plus two. So I'll jump to the i plus two index. I'll skip over middle. So I'll say i plus equal to two. Correct. And else, if this condition is fulfilled, that is a of uh, sorry, not fulfilled. That is a of i is less than equal to a of i plus one. I will only do i plus plus. And now, if upper limit is greater than equal to lower limit, I print a yes. Else, I print a sorry. If uh, uh, lower ah uh, correct uh, uh, upper limit is greater than equal to lower limit, or you can say lower limit is uh, less than equal to less than equal to upper limit. Then you print a yes. Else, you print a All right, so is the code now clear? Yes, sir, clear. All right. So now, what do we have the time complexity with this? Definitely O of n, right? I am definitely having a loop over here, n loop, correct? And then I have a while loop also over here, but that loop is also either jumping two indices or jumping one indice. Worst case, even if you take it's jumping uh, single indices, although it's not going to be the case, but order, you can say that while loop is also running in order of O of N. So I can say overall time complexity is O of N, which is definitely fulfilling our condition for two into, I think two into 10 per five order, right? Yeah, two into 10 per five order. So good to go, right? And what is the space? Now, I think someone will argue that there is a space for input. So let me take that into consideration. So I can say space is O of N, all right? The only space for taking the input. Besides that, you are not using any extra space. Everything is very uh, variable based, you can say. All right, so I hope the second question has now, now become clear. Right? This is sort of a typical question, might be a bit hard to understand normally for a beginner, but if you uh, will go through the code piece again, and if you try out the logic for the lower limit and upper limit by some cases of everyone, you will clearly understand what the idea is trying to tell you. All right, so are we good to go? We'll move on to the third problem. Yes, sir. All right. So we have the third problem, binary substring. Correct. Uh, you are given a binary string S of even length, and you can perform the following operation on S any number of times. So it's written, what is the operation you are trying to do? Since binary string is there, that means it only has zero and one and it is of even length. That means you will select i and j indexes. They are going to be odd. You can only take both of the indexes to be in odd nature. You swap si with sj and you swap s of i plus one with s of j plus one. All right. So now this operation has, I think, now become clear. I'll try to uh, tell this operation uh, in the cases itself. But what is the target now? What do you think is given the target to us? What would be the rough CFT? Let, let us discuss this after the question. All right. All right. So what is going to be the, uh, I should say, uh, yeah. So what's the given target to us? You have to find the maximum length of non-decreasing substring of the string you can obtain using any or possible zero number of operations. So again, this non-decreasing term, I think non-decreasing is clear now. For beginners, I'm telling non-decreasing means, as I explained, equality condition also fulfills. So you need a non-decreasing substring. Remember, a substring. So what is a substring? Substring is a continuous section of the string. Or if, uh, yeah, yeah, so in this string part, the continuous section is called a substring. So you say, I need a maximum length of non-decreasing substring. Now, remember, any number of operations is possible. You have no boundation on the number of operations. So if any number of operations is possible, do you think I should approach this question by actually trying to simulate the operations. No, because if any number of operations are possible, I can argue that questions like this actually indicate you are not binded by number of operations, then don't try to simulate. Think of something better and let's try to come up with an intuition. If I can 
actually pick up the point without simulation, what can I actually achieve? All right. All right. So now what is the case given to you? Uh, now N is given in three into 10 by five order N is given. So N is pretty huge, right? That means again, as explained, expected time complexity is O of N or if you go N log N, not N square and definitely not this brute math. So O of N could, should be a good target in your mind. Now you look at the sample cases. You say, all right, the array, uh, the string was one, one, zero, 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 zero. And the answer was six. What did they do? Essentially, they took I, let's say as this I, uh, and this as J, I think the positions are now become clear, right? This was taken as I, and this was becoming taken as J. And then they swapped this and this, and then they swapped this and this. So now you had the string looking like zero, 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 one, one. And this is the whole string is actually non decreasing in manner. So the answer is six. What about this explanation is given. So I think becomes pretty clear. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. You take indice, select one and three, swap them. So string looks like one, zero, zero, one, and the maximum length is three. Now they have not given the explanation of the last case. So I'll give you that. And then we'll try to bring the intuition. All right. Why do you think the answer for this is seven? What uh, in dice, do you think I should actually change in this case, if this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, I have a zero based indexing. What do you think am I changing in this? I am picking up zeroth index. I am picking up this index. That is the second index. And I'll swap this out. So now if I have something that looks like zero, zero, one, zero, then I think, uh, you have a zero, zero and one, one, you select this, you select this. Swap these two and then swap these two. So what does it become now? You now have something that looks like one, zero, 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 and a one, one. And seven is the appropriate length that is definitely non decreasing So I hope this must have become clear by looking at the cases. This must have become clear that this is how I'm getting the seven answer. And this will also be, build a small intuition in your mind. All right. So we'll try to build intuitions. All right. So now even before starting the string, if I ask you, if I first ask you, when you do this operation, what are you essentially changing? Are you changing any value? Is some zero becoming one at that particular place? Yes, that can happen. So you are saying that, all right, if I observe, if I, if I say that, if I observe a single index, then that single index value, if currently is zero, it might change to one. But remember, I and J both are taken as odd. That means you can look at the string now as pairs of two to uh, two to indices. Meaning, let's say you had S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, and S6. Now, if I say you are going to do some operation by taking S1, and S3, then essentially you are trying to bring S3 with S4 as this position and S1, S2 at this position. And then S5 and S6 are common. So you are changing the whole segment or you're swapping the whole segment of two, two pairs. Is this clear? Now, because you're essentially doing this. Now, what will I, uh, what is my argument now? If let's say there is there is two zeros coming as a pair. Don't you think you can take these two zeros and report your answer as two or starting answer, potential starting answer as two. You can, right? That means all the zeros, all the zeros as a pair can be reported as one of the possible answers. What, what do I mean by this? What do I mean by this? Let's say, Let's say the uh, characters were zero, zero, then let's say one, one, and then zero, zero. Now, if I ask you, can you club just focus on zero zeros? How many zero zeros do you have in this? Two. Just focus on these two. My argument is you can bring them to together. You can bring them together. How? Take this segment, take this segment, swap them. 
So this becomes 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1. So now you know all the zeros came together. That means definitely you have, if you have some number of zeros together, you have that potential maximum length definitely with you as your maximum length, because you, wherever these two zero zeros are kept together, you can club all the zeros together, bring them these two, two pairs of zero, zero zeros together to form a new string or form the string, which will have that substring section as all zeros. And you can take that length that is non-decreasing. Now adding onto that same logic for one, one, if let's say, if let's say you had one, one, some one, one over here, some, let's say, maybe, maybe, or, or let's say you had a one, one pair here, then let's say something else. Then let's say this one, one pair over here, then one, one pair over here and so on. Now, can't you argue? I can bring all these three one, one pairs together. I can, I can say that. Let me take this to one, one. Let me take this one, one. Let me take this one, one. I can maybe take whatever two pair was coming over here and this swap them out. So this becomes one, 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 one and something. Then this, whatever block was there over here, then something one, one. And then I can take this, take whatever block was remaining over here. Let's say I am only taking two, two blocks. So I know one, 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 one gets together. And then I have whatever is the rest of the string you can say, meaning, you know, one ones can also be collected together. So zeros can be collected together. Ones can be collected together. Now let's try to build up more. You can collect all the zeros together. So zero zeros can be collected together if possible. One ones can also be collected together if possible. Now, if you know that there are some zeros, let's say there are some X zeros, zero zeros, sorry. And some Y one ones in the string, then can you place all the zero zeros? and all the one ones like this to expand the maximum length of your string. You can correct. Is this making sense? Let's say you had three zero zeros. You can make those three zero zeros to come together. And then let's say you had two Y's. Let's say you had two, uh, two, uh, value of two, uh, Y as two. That means you had two one ones together. So you can bring these two one ones together. And now your expanded length is this total length, which is non decreasing in order. Is that right? But what the case states, the type of double pair is zero, zero, either, either it's a one, one, but it doesn't stop here. It can also be zero one or it can be one zero. So how do I handle them? I am good to go for this, right? I know that if I have some zero zeros over here, if I have some zero zeros, zero zeros type, bring them together, just next to them, bring all the ones together. And I will have the best possible maximum substring that will come between, which is non decreasing in order. But I have some, let's say I have some zero one and I have some one zero also as pairs. What do I do about that? What do I do about that? Can these, can this help me increase my length? Argument is yes. Up till here, the pattern's good to go. Now let's say you had a zero one. If I insert this zero one between this, do you think my length gets increased and the length and the substring still remains non-decreasing? Yes, it does. Correct. So I know zero one can come between this and let's say now I had a one zero. Where do you think I can keep a one zero? I can keep a one zero over here. And I can also keep a one zero over here. Is that right? That means I have just formulated the best possible substring. Now. If I had some zeros, some ones, some zero one and some one zeros. Ideally, I should have created a string that first has a one zero, then all the zero zeros together. Then if there is a zero one, a zero one, then all the ones together. And if now I have some one zero left, I can keep a one zero. Now, after this, if let's say I will have some leftover zero ones or leftover one zeros, do you think? I can place them anywhere, which will increase my, 
size of this substring, what uh, actually I'll mark up this, what is the current maximum length of substring, which is non-decreasing this, this visible from over here. This is why I had kept a one zero over here because it is adding up a zero beyond uh, below uh, before this. And I kept a one zero over here because it's adding a one after this one. Correct. So I have this length. Now let's say I had some more one zeros and some more zero ones. Where do you think you should keep a zero one? If you keep the zero one anywhere between, do you think that's going to break your pattern? If let's say you keep the zero one over here, zero one over here, pattern gets break because now I have zero one, zero one, not decreasing. It's not, not decreasing. Cannot keep it over there. Can I keep it over here? No, not, not good enough. Keep it over here. No, not good enough. Not good enough. That means this is the ideal pattern. Now, even if I have some zero ones or some one zeros, I can just keep them anywhere after this or before this. Is that right? This is the idea behind the problem. Arguably, you will try to make the string look like some one zero, so, sorry, for one single one zero, then all the zero ones clubbed, then zero one, then all the ones clubbed, and then a one zero if possible. And then whatever are the leftover, only you will have some leftover one zeros either or some leftover zero one. So you will say either I'll all this one zero and zero one can be kept anywhere before this or can be kept anywhere after this. I will not try to hamper the middle part because I, that is, that has given me a very good and a, and appropriately the longest string I could have created in the non-decreasing manner. All right. So how do you think of an approach like this, Rajat? Such an approach. I actually, th this is why I could have started the question right and right from here. I tried to build this intuition from here. When I was solving the question, I thought of this question like this. First, I analyzed that. If I am binded to create a maximum length consisting only of zero zeros, zero zeros, two zeros together paired up, I will, I can look in that direction. That intuited me to a next approach where that could have applied this. I could have applied the same logic to all the ones getting clubbed together and giving me a maximum length again. And then that idea hit me that all right, I had some zeros. I had some ones. Let me club together them where all the zeros fall before and all the ones fall after that is definitely now going to increase my length more. Initially, if all the zeros were here, you had a length of six, that is six, three into two, that is six. Correct. You have three zero zeros coming together. That means that gives you a length of six. You had a length of four from here. Now, if you club them together, don't you have a length of 10, which is non-decreasing? Yes. That means this is where I started the idea. I started with an idea with zero zeros, one ones, and then clubbing. And next I thought, but all right, I did not had, it is not necessary that I have zero, zero, one, one. I will either, I can have zero, one and one, zero also. So how do I handle those? Can that help me increase my length from 10 to something more? This is what was my next intuition or next question to me. And this is where I made cases and saw that yes, a zero, one can contribute to get fit between the zero zeros and one ones to get an added length of two and a one zero can contribute its last zero. If I place it before all the zeros or it can contribute a one. If I place this after all the ones, correct to increase my size. So if a zero one falls, keep it in between gets increased by two. So I have now have a length of 12. And now when I say, yeah, correct. This is kind of an ad hoc problem. This is, this has no specific pattern to this. This is just simple reasoning and algorithm to see, observe and observe. All right. So now when I say length is 12, now I argued one zeros were there. What if I place this one zero be before all the zeros, I get an added one length because this zero also now contributes to the max answer. Uh, length gets 13. And if I still have a one zero with me, let me keep it after all the ones. I will now take, get the contribution of this one also, which will make my length to 14 now. And wasn't my target to every time keep on increasing my maximum length, as long as I'm able to create a non-decreasing pattern. Yes. And I am still fully in the, fulfilling the case because I am having zeros and then all the ones, this is definitely non-decreasing, not a doubt over there. All right. So I hope the approach has now become clear. Is there any doubt to this? So what will we essentially try to do? 
we can essentially look at the code first, all right? This is going to make sense with the code only, not going to discuss directly to that approach. All right, you can see, I'll take the input, n size, string s. Now I've created an unordered map and I've named this very clearly string categories. What do you mean by string categories? Category of zero, zero, category of one, one, category of zero, one, and category of one, zero. And now I'll argue if S of I is zero and S of I, I plus one, I will increase the category I have in my ideology. I'll keep string category as zero to represent all zero zeros. Category one to represent all one ones. Category two to represent zero ones and category three to represent one zeros. Now, how did I build the string over it? I said, keep all the zeros together, keep all the ones together. So initially my max length starts I know the ideal string has to look like one zero first, then zeros, then zero one, then ones, and then leftover one zero. So this is the ideal case, but that is not definite. That is not necessary that you have the all, you have zero zeros or you have one these zeros or zero ones. That is not the ideal case, but we'll try to build the case, right? Ideally I'll start by building and saying, take the maximum length as two into category zero plus two into category one. Now category zero is all the zeros category one is all the ones. And I know if I have, let's say, as I explained, if X was three, meaning category zeros were three, then I had an initial length contributing as six. I added on to that the length of Y into two, that is four. So I've started off with creating a string that looks like all the zeros first, and then all the one ones first zero zero, sorry, first and all the one ones first clear. Now I, what did I next do while creating this? I inserted this with a red pen to show you. I argued now, if I have a zero one, I'm going to keep the zero one in between over it. So for that, I'll say is category string of two positive. If it is, that means I will add that zero one between the zeros and ones. And how will that increase my max length? It will increase my max length by two. So I'll increase max length by two. And now next part, I had showed you with the red pen again. If you have some one zeros, what do you do with that? You first say, if I have some one zero, I will take this one zero and I'll keep it at the start to increase my max length by one. So I'll check is my string length greater string length, uh, sorry, string category of three greater than zero. That is, is my one zero type coming greater than zero. If that is the case, then I will increase my max length by one and I will decrease my string category by one because I have used up this one zero, right? Now extend it to this. If now I still have some string length greater than zero. If my string string, sorry, string category, sorry, string category of three greater than zero, or uh, this can be also written as greater than zero for better understanding. If string category of three is still greater than zero, you can say it is still possible to add a one zero at the end also. So I'll again increase my max length. And after this, I need to stop. I have just created the best possible string that is out there, having the maximum length stored in the maximum length variable. And I will have maybe some leftover zero ones and one zeros, they can be placed anywhere to the extreme left or the extreme right. As I showed you, they are not going to hamper my answer. Is that right? And I create a, I print the max length as my output. All right. Cool. So I think the part has become now clear. Now, what do I, how do I uh, handle the time, uh, calculate the time and space? Pretty easy to sim pretty simple calculation, right? You are using an unordered map. Unordered map has O of one complexity for everything. Insertion, addition, so on, whatever you say, right? Average complexity. So if you, you could have also maintained a vector maybe. So I have maintained an unordered map. I am looping, correct? I'm looping and I'm looping every time shifting two indices, I plus equal to two. So I know this is running in N by two iterations. Or if you report the order, it is still n. Correct. If you uh, don't take into consideration the constant factor of dividing n by two, you still have the factor of n. Good to go. That means I know order of this loop is n. And insertion in this is definitely acting in one complexity because insertion is in unordered map is constant. So what do you think is the time complexity now? This code is if else. So this is not contributing any time complexity. Time complexity is definitely O of n. Now, what about space? I have used up a string. If you don't argue about the string, you are argue, can argue about the map. And the map is going to have maximum four string categories. 
So I can say that O of four can be written as maps space, which is again, since you never report a complexity in some K factor, which is constant, you know, this can be reported as constant. And just, I just wrote four to show you that four is the maximum length of the map, but since four is so small, it can be considered as constant space. All right. For selecting a particular value also, it is correct. It is O1. Every uh, operation on an unordered map is O of one complexity. And if I can extend to this, every operation on an ordered map is log of n, where n is the size of the map. So if I would have used a map in this case, my complexity would have increased, but I don't need to do that. I'm good to go. Even if I would have increased my complexity, I think I would still have been not gone past the barrier of TLE. That is why I can say that you can could have also used a map, not a big deal. Just, this is just creating a frequency map kind of, right? So frequency map creation can be done anyway. Take a vector, take an unordered map, take a map, whatever. All right. So good to go. I think problem three is pretty clear. Can we begin with problem four? All right. So I think no doubts for problem three. Correct. Let us begin with problem four. So very interesting problem. And this is a bit manipulation problem, right? You have to imagine bits and you should have a grasp of bits in this, right? But if you do, even if you don't do, I'll try to make this as easy as for you to understand. Right. And we'll try to discuss some basic operation bit operations. And I'll, I'll try to clear up as much as I can. So we'll go ahead with reading the question. You were given a positive integer X and what did it tell you? Take up two positive integers or report two positive integers A and B. The limit of A and B is very huge. So this is something to consider, right? Why would they give you a very high limit? This is something to consider. You should have a focus on the exact parts of the question. So limit is very huge. Report A and B, they can be in order of 8 into 10 to part 18 also. Not a problem for them. But the condition that they should satisfy is A and B and A or B should be divisible by X and should be positive. Where and is defined as bitwise and and ZOR is defined as bitwise ZOR. So you need to help Chef find these two numbers and they have given that answer always exists. So we don't have to think about negative one conditions, right? That is a small part they have done on their side only. Answer definitely exists. Correct. If there are multiple solutions, you can print any. Naturally, there could have been multiple solutions. We'll try to bring up the most efficient solution we, which we can think and argue. All right. So I'll give a brief uh, just on AND and ZOR operation for all the beginners in this. If you think, uh, what do you think is AND, bitwise AND? What is the essential meaning of bitwise AND? Or if I drop the table for AND. If let's say this is bit 1 and let's say this is bit 2 and I take the AND. If this is 0, 0, 1, 1. If this is... One, uh, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, and gives you zero, zero, one, and also gives you zero, one, zero, and gives you zero, and only one, one, and gives you one. That means if both the bits are set for two bits, you take and is one else the bit and is zero. Now, what about ZOR? I'll take this with ZOR also bit one, bit two. All right. This is very basic stuff. I think we should all be familiar with this. You take bit. 0, 0, 1, 1, and this is 0, 1, 0, 1. 0, 0, ZOR gives you 0. 0, 1, ZOR gives you 1. 1, 0, ZOR gives you 1. And 1, 1, ZOR gives you 0. Essentially meaning that if there are odd number of 1s, when you take the bit of some bits, in this case, what is the count of 1 in this? 1. You have 1, 1 coming time. And this is also 1. In this, how many 1s were there? 2. And in this, how many 1s were there? 0. So if you have odd number of ones coming, ZOR is 1. And if you have even number of ones coming, ZOR is 0. So I hope this is clear. All right. Now, let us look at the question. All right. No doubts on this. Cool. So now, I'll give you a very small hint in this question by experience. When you argue that you are trying to find some numbers, you must have solved this sort of questions. This pops on code forces, code chef, where you are trying to keep report some number a b c satisfying some conditions so on so on so on by experience you can keep this as a mental note also mostly what happens is it would be ideal for you to try to minimize as number of lowest number of variables you can meaning what what do i mean by say uh, what do you mean by this the count of variables currently for you to find is two that is a and b what if i tell you fix some a then don't you think your argument will only be to find B? 
let's say i argue that a is some fixed number forget although the question was asking you to find a which could have been anything let me take a as some fixed number and then let me find b so my first ideology starts with by experience or you can even take it as a mental note i need to shorten the number of constraints for me to find or shorten the number of variables sorry i need to find variable count currently is 2 let me fix a and see if i can make or find b quickly why am i getting this uh, uh, intuition in my head you will argue looking at the cases if you look at the case 2 you were given x as 5 what did the report as x uh, sorry a and b they reported one number as 5 and one number as 15 now meaning they reported 5 that means you can start thinking in this direction that had two variables a and b to find what if i fix a to be x what if i say out of the two variables now i am not going to find two variable constraints rather argue that fix a as x now i'll try to find by bit knowledge can i find a b such that x and b equals to x and x zor b is equal to sorry uh, sorry uh, not x sorry x and b is equal to some number some number let's say n n1 which is divisible by x that is n1 uh, i should say n1 mod x is equal equal to 0 and x and uh, sorry x zor b is some number n2 let's say which is again divisible by 0 Uh, divisible by x gives you a mod value of zero. So what will I? How did I begin my intuition? I said, let me fix a. If I fix a, that means a becomes x. I say now I will try to deduce if I can find b, which satisfies my condition. All right. So is the approach up till here clear? Is my intuition becoming clear? Why am I saying this? naturally definitely this is coming with experience but you can guys are here to learn and learn and get a idea of about how do we approach problems like this so what did i uh, say up till here problems which have some variable findings are problems where you can start turning your head in the direction of asking yourself let me try to not argue i'll find all variables let me see if some variable can be fixed some variable can be reduced can i reduce the number of variables i had to find if i can then i will have less number of work to do and i it would be ideal for me to do, do less number of work right that means let me fix a so i fixed a to be x now argument has changed these two conditions are now in the background all right so now i have x now let let us make some bits of x all right i say bits of x let's say x was there so x will have some bits i'll represent x in binary format let's say x was in binary format looking like maybe uh all right all right actually in this case only let's say x was 5 so i'll represent x in binary format 1 0 1 good to go now you need a number b with which you and and you get a number which is divisible by x now let's say let's say i make the number b as a number where all the bits of the x number are turned on and rest bits i don't care let's say i take the number b as fix this bit as 1 fix this bit as 1 and then let's say maybe i can keep this as 1 also or 0 also not not a big deal and then because b can extend to 10 to the power 18 so maybe i can have 0 over here 0 over here maybe a 1 over here and i know this is going to be 0 0 0 again up there because this is x right If I do this, what do you think I am getting? If I add this out, if I add this out, let's say this was zero, this was zero. This is B, right? I have done B, and I have fixed the condition that in B I am taking the bit in the X which was set in B also set, and the other bits ideally anything, either a zero, either a one, not a big deal. So if this bit is one, I need a one over here. If this bit is one, this is one over here. I am not going to now bother with the other bits. If I take a and now. i know since all the bits in x which are zero will give me a zero bit so if this is zero this gives me a zero bit irrespective of whatever is placed at b at this bit this gives me a zero 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 this also gives me a zero if this was one or zero not would have been a big deal right because zero and zero or zero and one both gives me zero 
I'm doing an and operation. Correct? And operation. But because these two bits are turned on, one, one, and is one. So I get a one, and I get a one. What number is this essentially? Can you identify what this number is? This number is x, right? And isn't x divisible by x? Yes, it is. So again, my mind ran in the condition that I am trying to lower my lower the, I should say, reduce the amount of work I need to do. So I'm trying to think with the cheapest possible X I can create or cheapest possible N1, sorry, N1 I can create. My target was to create an N1, right? What is the cheapest possible N1 that was there, which would have fulfilled your condition? Condition on N1 is only it should be positive and should be divisible by X. Why not make N1 as X? If I make N1 and N1 as X, I'll be only following the condition where in the number B, I will be wanting to make, I'll be wanting to make all the bits in X to be equal to one and other bits I'm not concerned of. So up till here, I have, I'm getting a good idea of B. Number B should be such a number for which all the bits in X, which are turned on should be definitely turned on. This is condition one on B. By this condition, I am definite that I'll be able to and them and create a number N1, which will give me a number X because I know X and with B, if this condition of B is satisfied, what is the condition? Condition is, I'll actually write this on your new page. I'm trying to deduce B, right? So I have placed a very small and a minute condition on B. Condition on B is set bits wherever, wherever X is set or wherever bit in X is set, or sorry, bit in X is set. This is condition one on B. So I'm reducing the possibilities of B, right? As I told you, I have fixed A as X. Now my next target is to find B, right? So out of all the possibilities of B, uh, 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 shouldn't I be concerned with trying to reduce and reduce and reduce the space of B? So this is how I've reduced the space of B. Now on by this condition, I know that I can take B as a number, which will have all the bits one wherever X was set and other bits I'm not concerned of. By this condition, if I take the and, I am for short to create a number N1, which is definitely going to be X. And I know X modulo X is different. Zero X is a factor of itself, right? That is definitely the case. X will divide X. So I have satisfied the first condition. Now I'm going to look at the second condition. Second condition is, I'll talk about the second. I am uh, sorry. Second condition is it also had to satisfy the condition that Zor gives you a number that is divisible by X. Correct. So again, I'll write the number again. So this was one zero one and you had some zeros over there. And I had argued that the number B should have these bits set. Now I'll try to begin with the next condition up till here. I had said that in this condition, other bits I'm not concerned with only this bits I, I want to set, but now I'll explore more. What should be the other bits? Ideally, what can I keep the other bits to make sure when I take a Zor, I get a number that is divisible by X. That is N2. All right. How do I do that? No, 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 no. Zero is not going to be the case. I'll tell you the ideal case. What is going to be the ideal case? Ideal case is going to be, you can start by analyzing. If let's say I want N2 to be divisible by X. That means if I create a number, this is the number X, right? I'll mark this with red. This is the number X. Essentially, this is the number X, right? After this, all the bits are zero. So essentially the number currently is one zero one in binary format. That is five. If I create a number N2 that looks like one zero one over here and the rest of the bits, the rest of the bits are kept as this is, uh, I'll mark this in blue. So this was one, this was one, correct. And now I can say, I will keep this as zero. And after this other bits, I'm not concerned with. So this can be zero. If I create a number like this N2, 
sorry, if I create, sorry, uh, this is not N2, actually, this is going to be B. If I create this number as B, if I create this number as B, all right, if I create this number as B, then what do you think is going to be N2 now? What do you think is going to be N2? Zor them. I get a number that looks like 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Correct? Then a 0, 0, 0, 0. That means I'll get a number in which essentially, I'll, I'll actually take up this on the next page if that is not becoming clear. I'll repeat this again. You have 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, so on. And you took the number B as 1, 0, 1. That is definite. And then again, a repetition of 101. Zor this out. You get a number, you get a number that is 101000 and some zeros over there. So on, so on, so on. This number is N2. Don't you think N2 is divisible by X? It is. Why? Because essentially this number X, N2, sorry, this number N2 is, what is this number? This number is the number X shifted to the right by three places. Is that right? This is the number 101. 101 was the number. I shifted the number 101 three places to the right. Correct. It got multiplied by 2 to the power 3. And when I did that, I know that this number is definitely divisible by X. Because if x into 2 to the power 3 is divisible by x, I know this can be n2. And to create n2, what did I did? What did I do? What did I take my b to b? I took my b to b, 101 definitely over here. And just a copy of 101 again on the next few bits. So I took 101 over here, copied these bits in b, and then I copied 101 as bits after three places again in b. Now, Check for condition one again, condition two what fulfilled, but did you violate condition one? No, you did not. Because if now you take and with B, what do you think are you going to get? Since all, I'll mark this in red. Since all the bits after 101 are zero, when you take and you will get a number that looks like S, X. So N1 will be received as X. That will be actually 101 and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, so on, so on. And, but you, if you, if you zor them, you will now get a number that is X into some part shifted, which is actually now a divisor, divisor of X again. So N1 was essentially, I have made N1 to be X and N2 to be X into two to the power three or to be very detailed, not exactly two to the power three, but two to the power MSB plus one. Isn't that right? What do, you, what do you mean by MSB? What, what do I mean by MSB? MSB is the ma maximum or the largest set bit. If I start with a correct maximum, most significant bit, whatever you name that, right? Not an, uh, not, uh, not in that, right? So most significant bit, I'm sorry for that. Correct. So most significant bit is MSB. MSB starts from zero from the left hand side. So if this is zero bit, one bit, second bit, so on. So if I calculate the MSB, that is two. Because I know that is up till where X is set and I do MSB plus one. That is if I multiply X with two to the power three, that is what gives me N2 and N1 is becoming X. Both numbers are definitely a factor of X or are divisible by X. And to create such numbers, ideally I had created the number B. I had fixed A as X and the number which I had created as B was actually X. And then after three bits, again, a copy of X. Is this understood? And henceforth, I fulfilled my condition. So this is the idea behind the problem. Now, now imagine this in this way. Why did this, this intuition come to my head? When I started the question, I told you, why did the, it, it, hit, it hit me directly? I looked at the case and I said, why did they give me a 10 to the power 18 limit? Why? They could have given me a smaller limit than this. Why are they giving me very such a high limit? Because the idea I just told you fits my intuition. Essentially, to make the number B, 
in this case, you have only had three bits, right? Which were set or maximum three bits, which you had had one zero one was covering a segment of three. If let's say I talk about a number 10 to the power nine order, 10 to the power nine order is going to have the limit of indirectly saying that if now you calculate B, B is still going to get in the limit of 10 to the power 18. Are you able to imagine why? Is this becoming clear? By my idea, if I now calculate B, B is still coming in the limit of 10 to the power 18. Is that right? That means, yes, I am good to go. All right. So this is the whole idea behind the problem. This is what I have to do. So essentially I'll fix my A to X and my B and now I'll calculate B and to calculate B now, this is where the implementation part of the question will start to calculate B. I know what B looks like. B definitely looks like X up till here. It definitely looks like X. Then it also looks X again after the third bit. So how do I do that? How do you think I should do that? I'll do a very quick bit manipulation technique. Tell me if you can follow up with that. I'll say a becomes X. This is definite. A becomes X. Not to end, not to bother about this X. Sorry. Now I'll start with saying B is also X. And I'll say, I'll calculate the shift parameter. I'll name this variable. I'll say shift parameter, which will be log base two of X plus one. Log base two of X is going to give me the MSB. And plus one is going to give me the MSB plus one. And now I'll shift B to the right by this shift parameter. And after I do this, I know that this B number one, zero, one, zero bits would have shifted three times together. And these places would have actually filled up to look like three zeros, but I do, I want them to look like one, zero, one. So how do, how do I do that? How do I do that? Simple bit addition. I can now write B plus equal to N, sorry, plus plus equal to X. Or actually you can take or also it works. So I have gone with this trick. Definitely you can take or also works. So now if you add on X to B, what is going to happen? Or if you take also or in either case, what is going to happen? These zero, zero, zero bits, which you just created as you can say a space of fitting B X now will have all the bits, which look exactly like the bits of X one, zero, one. And B is voila created. Now you have a number B, which looks like X and X again in this case, and A is definitely X. Now, if you print A and you print B, good to go, I will get a correct answer. All right. So I hope the approach has now become clear. Again, I'll repeat, why did I get this approach in my head? Because I saw A and B were very huge. First thing. Second, because I knew keeping two constraints was a very bad, uh, would have been very tedious for me to calculate A and B together. That is why I thought, let me fix A and then try to come up with an idea. What can I look towards B? Because now my constraints are lower. My variable count is lower. So by experience also, as I said, you are here to learn, take this as a mental note. Problems like this actually have solution 99% of the time solutions like this, where you actually try to reduce first the number of variables so that you have lower work to calculate. And this is what I did. I fixed a as X. And then it was all about basic manip bit manipulation and observation. I, once I fixed X, uh, once I fixed a, I was first able to fulfill condition, uh, one, which gave me a hint that B should have the bits one that started off telling me that bit is definitely B is definitely looking like a number X initially, but then to fulfill condition two, it gave me a next approach. And it told me I could have actually placed X also. And then X one more time at like this, that would have fulfilled the sore condition also. All right. All right. So now we can look at the code part code is going to be literally two lines. If now you have understood the approach, took the test case took N. Now I'll take a and B again. I'm taking this in long, long complexity. Why? Because I know a, B and B are to be reported in 10 to power 18 order. So fix a as N 
and B as n. Or uh, I can actually take this n as x for you. So we will have a better idea. X. Correct. Now, shift parameter log 2x plus 1. That is highest bit set. That is plus 1. Now I'll shift B to the right by that parameter and I'll add X to this. And once I do print A, print B, good to go. You're going to get a right answer. All right, not on this, definitely. Multiple answers was possible. But if you cross verify, you can see 2 and 10 are definitely a divisor of 2. And uh, 5 and 45 are also a divisible number by 5. So good to go. All right, so I hope the approach has now become clear. Now, what about time complexity? I have used a very small STL call to log two. You have power functions, log two functions. So in the backend, this runs in basic log two complexity. So you can say log calculating the MSB is going to be log two power. So overall time complexity for this is log two n. And space is constant, even for the taking input part. So everything is well within my boundaries. And this is where I can, yeah, I am teaching in 11, one and two from TLE 10.0. All right. All right, so I think we can actually end our PCD now. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed the problems. All right, so I'll stop the recording.